So the Mishnah tells us like this. The Megillah could be read on the 11th of Adar, 12th of Adar, the 13th of Adar, 14th and the 15th of Adar, not earlier or not later. Now, it doesn't mean that anybody could read the Megillah on any of these days. There's there's conditions. Cities that were surrounded by walls since the days of Yoshua ben Nun read the Megillah on the 15th, and that we, uh, that we practice until today. And villages and unwalled cities will read the Megillah on the 14th. However, villagers have permission to read the Megillah on the earliest market day, which is um, um, up until the 11th of Adar. So let me explain how this used to work. I had to do some research here, because the Gemara talks about this in the, in the Talmud of Megillah in depth, uh, and that's where we know this from. The Mishnah is just giving us the, the source of it, but the Talmud expands on it. So basically, the way it used to work then, the way it used to work in the in ancient times, of especially in the land of Israel, but I'm sure this was very similar in other in other countries as well, is you had the walled cities, cities that were basically the 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 capitals or the main centers of commerce or the you know the elites would live there, and they were they were built with a fortress because they were like the holdout cities if let's say if they were being conquered or if they were facing a threat from a nearby country. So this the fortified cities were considered to be like the best place to live. They were the prime real estate. Uh, and they were like the main cities of the of the uh, of, of the country. Then you had um, then you had the other cities. They weren't necessarily villages, but they were like cities. But they were not walled in a sense that they were. A lot of people lived there, but it wasn't considered to be like a stronghold or a um, or definitely not like a capital. It was just a city. And then you had villages, which were more like the farms. Now. All three of them depended on each other, according to what the Talmud says here, because the cities could not mass produce because they, they were so densely populated. They didn't have any space for manufacturing. They didn't have any space for um, for crops. They didn't have any space for wh whatever they whatever needed to be consumed. So the cities would have to buy all of their goods from the villagers. Just one second. Yeah, come in. Come in. You're good. Yeah, all good. Got this. Um, so the village, so the cities would have to rely on the on the on the the walled cities would rely on the those who lived outside for all of their crops who came from the villagers because they were the farmers. They were the ones who produced the crops. And this the non-walled cities were was where manufacturing would take place. Obviously, it's not the manufacturing of today, but the point is is that. They had the space to to put, you know, to, uh, um, I guess, put together the things that were needed um, and and produce things other than food. And then they would bring it to the marketplace in the walled cities. And that's where they would sell it to the people in the cities who had the money, who were able to afford whatever they were producing. Now, the marketplace took place every Monday and Thursday. So. Let's say, so now let's go into the next half of the mission. So let's say Purim, the 14th, if Purim falls out on, on Monday, so the Megillah um, is read in the villages and in unwalled cities on the net, uh, in unwalled cities on the 14th, on that day, on, on Monday, on the market day. And then in the walled cities, it's read on Tuesday, which is the 15th, which is the way it was originally established. However, Let's say the 14th of Adar, which is the original Purim, which is the main Purim, that's the one we all celebrate Purim, falls out on Tuesday or Wednesday. So the Megillah is read on the market day of Monday beforehand and on the following day by, by the walled cities. Why was this? Because the Torah did not want, the sages did not want to have to make the villagers and the city, the city dwellers come into the walled cities. And it, they had to come in anyways for market day. And that was a big schlep. They would have to take all their stuff, and it was it was a real big burden for them. So, as a way to prevent any additional burden, they said they could listen to Megillah. They should hear the Megillah um, on the on the market day, which the market day could be up to the eleventh of Adar. Because let's say Wednesday, um, let's say Wednesday was the um, was was the fourteenth of Adar. So Monday would be the twelfth. So when was there a situation that you read it on the eleventh? Let's take a look. If the 14th of Adar falls on, on Thursday, the Megillah is read on that day in the villages, uh, in, uh, that day in the villages, in the unwalled cities, and on the next day in the walled cities. Okay. If the 14th falls on Friday, then the Megillah is read on the previous market day on Thursday in the villages on that day, 
uh, on that day in unwalled cities and on the following day in the walled cities, which would end up being Sunday because they would have to put, because they can't uh, observe Purim and Shabbat, so they would have to push it off to Sunday. So in certain cases, um, they would have, in certain cases, there was the Talmud tells us there's a one way that it's possible for the Megillah to be read on the 11th of Adar. And I think because if the market wasn't open on Thursday, so they would, even if Purim fell out, on Thursday, they would be allowed to read the Megillah on Monday at the Monday's market day or something like that. So basically, the Mishnah is establishing from the outset that there's situations where you read the Megillah on the 11th of Adar. But really, the main day of Purim is the 14th, and the 15th is for the walled cities. That's the main thing to remember. I know this is a little confusing, but it's going to be important for our lesson. So now, let us go into the how this was established. So the Talmud tells us that all of these dates of Purim, all the dates of, of Purim were not just made up some randomly, but they were established by the Antrik Nessus Agadola, and they were legitimately established. Um, and had they instituted Purim only on the 14th and the 15th, the sages of later generations, like the author of the Mishnah, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, would not have been permitted to add to those dates. They would not be able to say you're allowed to read the Megillah on the 13th, 12th, or 11th. They would have to say... The 14th or the 15th is the day, and that's it. Um, it is thus obvious that all these days were originally established by the Anshay Knesset Sagadola, that they established the 11th to the 15th as all legitimate days to read the Megillah in certain situations. How do we know this? Where do, where do, where do we learn this from? Because in the book of Esther itself, it says, and the Talmud quotes this, that it says that you should observe the days of Purim in their times. In other words, in their times leaves it open to the sages to give interpretation about when that when that really is. And it all goes back to the fact that the to differentiate between a biblical mitzvah and a rabbinical mitzvah, they had to create some sort of differentiation to say that in walled cities you read it on the 15th and non-walled cities you read it on the 14th. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this. This is about if you're traveling. So if you're traveling and and you're on a boat or or and and you and you don't have a Megillah or, or whatever the, or whatever the situation is, but that's that's not really re related to what we're talking about. So now the question is like this. If we want to celebrate the importance of the Purim holiday, why are we giving such flexibility? And think of the sages. Think of the sages are trying to, to don't forget, not all Jews lived in Shushan. Uh, the, most of Jews did live in Shushan, but not all Jews lived in Shushan. A massive miracle happens, and all Jews are saved, but not every Jew realized the, the, the intensity of the miracle, the intensity of the threat that was facing them. So the sages have to establish the validity and the importance of celebrating Purim and to, and to take it on as a holiday across all Jewish communities. So one way of doing that would be to have some uniform um, celebration that we're all celebrating on this day. So why are they leaving it to, to be so flexible that, you know, we want it to be convenient for you in the marketplace and all that stuff, which, by the way, we're not allowed to do that on our own. Like, we can't say, well, because it's easier for me to celebrate Purim a week early, I'm going to do that. We're not allowed to do that because that's not the mitzvah. We're not fulfilling the mitzvah. So why are the sages giving us so much flexibility with reading of the Megillah, especially if it seems as if the reason is just about convenience, if the mitzvah is important, if the mitzvah is is, is crucial to to the observance of Judaism, then um, it should be, this is the date, or these two are the dates. Uh, as we, I think we mentioned last week that um, when Haman was was telling Ahasuerus um, about how the Jewish people are so bad, so the Medrash says that he was saying that they have all these holidays and they can never work, they can never follow the schedule and, and do what the you know, and do the king's bidding because they're always busy with their holidays. And Hashem responded to Haman by saying, you're making fun of their holidays or you're, you're attacking their holidays. I'm going to give them another holiday to celebrate your downfall. So if the holiday is so important, why is there such flexibility? That's the question. Interestingly enough, the sages weren't so gung-ho on, on establishing Purim in the first place, according to the Medrash. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the Talmud quotes it. What does it say? That Esther, after the after the you know miracle happened and and they won the war and everything, so Esther sent word to the sages that this Purim should be. It says it towards the end of the Megillah as well that they sent letters to all the Jewish communities to establish Purim, and the sages wrote back that you know if we sell if we, if we create a holiday celebrating our triumph over the rest of all these other nations, it's going to make them hate us even more. 
So what did Esther write back? And this is a, this is very interesting. And look look at look in the uh, look in the in the in the Aramaic in the original. Um, actually, it's in Hebrew, but in the in the original text here. Sholchalahem Esther wrote back. Kasuvani al divri ayamim lemalchim adiparas. I already sent out to all the kings of the all the sorry all the princes and all the all the kings of of our nations that this is going to be a Jewish holiday. So it's already done deal. Like you like it's a formality. It's done. Now, the obvious question that comes from here, number one, if Esther already did that, why was she even asking the sages? Esther was the, literally the savior of all the Jewish people at this point. Mordechai was the undisputed leader of the Jewish people. So Mordechai and Esther together established the holiday. Why, like, why, like, why were they even asking for permission here to establish this as a holiday? And number two, if the sages are coming back with a counterpoint, how does the fact, well, I already told the Gentile kings an answer? Well, untell them, because the, since when do the sages determine halacha, determine Jewish law, based on what Esther told the Malchim Madeya Paras? Like, why would that be a, um, a factor in the decision? But what did the sages respond? The sages said, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't have it here. But the sages responded, since you you know you established it, it's done, and and they and they went along with it, and they and they uh, basically gave it their full blessing. So, so that being said, um, why was that answer enough for the sages to to change their minds? And not only that, here's the really powerful point. In the Medrash of Yaakov Shemini, it says that when Mashiach comes, all of the festivals, all of the holidays that we celebrate are going to disappear, except for Purim. Crazy, right? Passover, we're not going to need anymore because we're going to have a new holiday of freedom, which is when Mashiach comes. And the whole idea of freedom up until now, celebrating Pesach, is not really going to be as relevant. Uh, the same goes for many of our other holidays. The Torah, beginning of the Torah on Mount Sinai is going to pale and compare to the revelation of Torah when Mashiach comes. Now, it does say in Hasidus that that doesn't mean the holidays will will disappear. It's just we're going to see them in a whole new light. They're going to basically going to become new holidays. Because they're going to re it, the, the the light that was orig that originally set forth to create those holidays, the specialness and the uniqueness of that day is going to be revealed. So it's going to be a whole new holiday for us. Uh, so it doesn't mean that they're going to literally disappear. They're just going to change. But either way, why does Purim get to maintain its integrity? Get to maintain its original uh, celebration, even when Mashiach comes. If if we see that it wasn't even so clear that this is supposed to be a holiday, if Esther and the sages are, are having this back and forth, and the Talmud is telling us about that, the Talmud doesn't have to include it. They included it. Um, then why was it uh, why was it so obvious that this? Why is this holiday the holiday that's going to be um, um, forever part of the Jewish part of the Jewish festivals, even when Mashiach comes? So. Let's go to our to our lesson. Oh, it does have the answer here. Yeah, so the, the, the sages, it does have the answer. The sages wrote back, indeed, I wrote for you in three parts that basically they quoted, uh, they quoted from Mishle, uh, which what were they saying here? Okay, so let me explain this. So what they're saying here, it wasn't that they were worried about, about the nations not liking them because that doesn't really sound like a Jewish approach since when do we make halachic decisions based on how people feel about us. But what was really bothering the sages is that it says in Mishle that in the Torah cannot, the written Torah cannot record a story more than three times. So if we're talking about, you know, the, the war against Amalek, so we already have three distinct, um, Amalek is the, the ancestor of Haman, and Amalek is basically the antithesis of anti-Semitism and the antithesis of of hatred and and suffer and suffering of the Jewish people. So if the Torah tells us in Shamos about the actual first war of Amalek when Amalek attacked the Jewish people, that was number one. Then the then in in, in Devarim the Torah repeats it. We actually read that on, on this Shabbos. We read from that from that portion. Um and then in the story of Shol Hamelach wiping out wiping out Amalek is the third time. So there's already three distinct uh, mentions of the story of the war with Amalek, and they were concerned that if they're going to add in the written Torah a fourth, um, a fourth, um, a fourth example of a battle with Amalek, which is a battle against Haman, in the Purim story, it's going to violate this verse from Mishlei. However, 
what 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 was their conclusion? What was their conclusion that they that they came to, or how they allowed it? Is basically that devarim is more of a repeat. It's not it's not a distinct incident. It's just a repeat of what happens in Shemais, and therefore it's not really three times. And um, and the Purim story could be the third time. So they went along with it. And the Rambam reaffirms this, that all the books of the prophets and the Ksuvim will be nullified in the Messianic era, except for the book of Esther. So let me explain this for a second. Because the the five books, the Hamish Yechom are actually, there's somebody that I study with that, that always asks me, so when you say the Torah, do you mean the five books of Moshe? Do you mean the Tanakh? So obviously the Torah is inclusive of everything, not just the Tanakh, but also the oral Torah, which includes the Halacha, which includes Medrash, which includes Kabbalah, and every single book that was written with divine inspiration was given to Moshe at Mount Sinai. However, when we talk about the written Torah, so do we talk about the five books of Moshe, or do we talk about the entire Tanakh, which includes the, the Nevi'im the, and the Ksuvim? The Nevi'im is the prophets and the story of, 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 of the judges. Um, the story of Sh the book of Shmuel, the book of Kings, and, and Yeshaya, and Yecheskel, and uh, Tanei Asar, and all the other prophets. Uh, and then the Ksuvim is like the book of Tehillim, the Megillah. Uh, there's five Megillahs, actually. Um, and then there's Divri Hayamim, and there's there's the books of King Solomon. Mishle is one of the Ksuvim as well. So why are they going to, why are the books of the prophets and the and the Ksuvim and, and the scriptures, why are they going to be uh, nullified when Moshiach comes? Um, and the five books of Moshe won't be, and what's and what's with the book of Esther? So it all it all boils down to what role every part of the Torah plays during the time during the during Jewish history. Right now, we're in a situation throughout the last you know thirty three hundred years where the Torah is being revealed to us through many different methods and many different uh, partnerships between this, between the sages throughout every generation. So during the times of the first temple, uh, the Torah was being, or even before the first temple, but while the, while the Jewish people were in Israel. So the Torah was being revealed through the prophets and through the kings and through the different, um, and, and through the stories that took place then. That's how the Torah was being revealed, and the Torah was being transmitted orally by the sages when they entered Nasa Zagadola. Uh, and the same goes for the Ksuvim. In other words, the Ksuvim were all written in times during the 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 era of the Jewish people, where they were being they were able to receive the the connection, be able to receive the divine inspiration from the Torah through those through those um, methods that Hashem was sharing it with them. Then, after the destruction of the of the first temple, and after the exile of of Babylonia, and after Ezra and Nehemiah bring the bring the people back and build the second temple, so that was the end of the written Torah. It was also the end of prophecy, and it was also the end of the lust of idol of idol worship. And uh, for, interestingly enough, so what happens after that? So then you have the era which began, which led through through Shimon Atzadik and many other leaders, but. Eventually, what became known as the Tanaic era, they were the one, the Tanaim, the ones that that are quoted in the Mishnah, and they are basically the sages uh, who are known to be the the authors, or at least the the ones that are quoted um, in the Oral Torah, which is the Mishnah, the Talmud, um, Jewish law, and even the Medrash is all quoting these individuals during the during the era of the Second Temple and beyond. So every part of the Torah plays a role in exile in bringing us the godly revelation through the different channels of the Torah. When Mashiach comes, we're not going to need a lot of these anymore because Hashem is going to reveal that knowledge in a way that we won't need to have any um, any layers or any um, you know secrets hidden in Tanakh. We're just going to need the five books because of, in that point, it's going to be all revealed and all come clear to us. However, the book of Esther is unique because the book of Esther contains what's called the Atzmus Mohosu Yusbarak. It contains the essence of godly revelation, and that can never be nullified. In other words, all the other books, it's divine, divinely inspired, but it's divinely inspired with the purpose of connecting to the Jewish people at the time, in exile. The book of Esther is a revelation of God's infinite and God's essence, which is beyond exile or beyond anything. It's just God himself. And because the book of Esther reflects that, it can never become nullified. There's more to that, but let's let's go on because I want to make sure we get to our main message. Now, another fascinating fact about Purim is that Purim is not a Hebrew word. Purim is a um, is an Aramaic word, or, or um, I think it's an Aramaic word, but it's basically was the was the language of the time 
and the the idea of a lottery or the name of a lottery was was not a Hebrew word. It was not a Hebrew language. And yet the Megillah specifically quotes it, mentions it. The fact that it's mentioning in, uh, uh, in the written Torah, you have a non-Hebrew word is, is, is a very rare, rare occasion. And not only that, but we chose to call the holiday by a non-Hebrew name, by the name of the land that we were in. So we have to answer a few questions. Why the sages made Purim so flexible, reading the Megillah so flexible? Number one. Uh, number two, why were the sages and, and uh, Esther... And why does the Talmud tell us about the question if Purim should be a holiday or not? And number three, why do we call Purim by a, a non-Hebrew name, which we would think would be a non-holy language? Uh, why would we use that name instead of using a Hebrew word to describe the, 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 the story and the holiday and mention it in the Megillah? So the Alta Rebbe explains a little bit of the beginning of our, of our life lesson that we want to get from here. Before we read this, let's start by explaining something that there's there's two types of, of fascination and there's two types of of being wowed or being um, engaged or being um, excited, right? One is the situation calls for it. In other words, you have a holiday or you have a an event or you experience something that is so tremendous and so awesome that it leads you and brings you to want to experience and celebrate the moment as best as you can. Um, if something amazing happens to you, you close a very big business deal, you win a lottery, we're talking about lotteries here, um, or a family event, a family simpler, something, something that's really special that there's no choice other than be really, really happy and involved in the experience. Uh, the same goes for a spiritual experience. So, for example, on Yom Kippur, naturally, you're going to feel more, if you're in, in, in the right scenario, in the right um, environment, you're going to feel holy and spiritual because that's the point. The point is, is that we pray a whole day and we fast and we and we dress and we do things in a way to, to create that ambiance and environment of feeling holy and spiritual and connected because that is the day for it. Uh, the same goes for any other holiday or any other experience um, that we that we go that we go through or that we perform is because we're trying to put ourselves in a situation that is elevating us or breaking the the tr break, breaking the the trend or breaking the norm uh, or the routine in order to in order to make it special. Purim is just the opposite. Purim is not about trying hard to change a routine. Purim is about living within the routine and living within the boring life and still finding fascination in the minutest detail that you could find. It's about having a regular work day and still turning it into the happiest day of the year. And we're going to explain that a little bit more. But I'm giving you this as a preview of the lesson that we're going to uh, embark on the next few minutes. So the Alta Rebbe says like this, the results of the lottery appear to be random, right? Not rooted in reason, it's by chance. However, in truth, lotteries are determined by Hashem in a manner that transcends all reason. When you follow reason, you are free to make intellectual choices. When you throw lots, you basically are saying, I'm not going to making a choice. I'm leaving it totally up to, in their minds, leaving it up to chance. But really, it's Hashem who is in control. I, I paraphrase that a little bit. Um, and you're basically putting yourself at the mercy of the lottery, even if the results defy reason. That means that you throw your lot in with a divine supernal will that transcends reason. So here you had Haman, who was throwing a lot to decide which month to annihilate the Jewish people. By the way, it's another question about why we call it Purim, because the lottery seems to be so insignificant to the story. The fact that Haman decided to make a lottery um, to decide which month to choose, that's just like, it, may, it should be about the fact that he tried to annihilate the Jewish people and the fact that we won. Why is the lottery the, the essence of the name of the holiday and, and what we see the holiday as if it's just a small detail of in the incident that took place. So the Alta Rebbe is explaining that the lottery is actually re reflects the essence of Purim because the lottery is, is even if someone's not intending to do this, but the lottery is you're basically taking your intellectual uh, capacity away from the situation and you're completely relying on the fact that Hashem is going to, to, to decide the results and you're willing to accept the results that take place, which is may not sound spiritual because we know that lotteries are associated with gambling and everything else, but the idea of a lottery in its pure form 
is actually a, a, a rep, uh, somewhat of a representation of the infinite. Uh, and now the Alter Rebbe connects us to Purim. Therefore, they call these days Purim. What is Pur? Pur is, is the girdle, which is a lottery. Haman's Pur was an attempt to co-opt God's blessing in defiance of all reason through a lottery. By the way, if you read the Medrash, especially if you read Esther Rabbah, the Medrash Rabbah on Esther, Purim was, uh, sorry, Haman was a no stupid man. He was really smart and he was really knowledgeable in Judaism and knowledgeable in Jewish culture, Jewish traditions and the Torah um, in, in almost to a fault. He was pretty scary. Um, so what was the very fact that Haman told Achashverosh that he should get the Jewish people to sin in order to be able to get God to abandon the Jewish people, he knew he knew what he was talking about. He he. He knew the game. So here, what he's, what, why was Haman throwing a lottery? Why couldn't he just choose the month himself? Because what he was trying to do is get the infinite or, or tap into the infin infinity of God in order to basically get God's blessing uh, on what he was doing by saying, look, I'm using an I'm using a element of a representation of the infinite essence of God in order to bring that into my plans. And that failed. Why? Because God's will did not defy reason in support of the impure Haman, rather it supported the Jewish people who merited it through the other, uh, through the utter self, uh, in other words, the self-sacrifice, jeopardizing their lives for the one God. So the primary joy of Purim is that Haman's poor, Haman's lottery, or attempt to, to tap into the, to, to God's infinite, to God's infinite, dissolved, and, and the, and the transcendental divine will, uh, will focus exclusively on the Jewish people. So, what? Why would Ham? If Haman was so smart, why would he actually think that he could succeed? What is what is the the thought process? If Haman knows that, that God promised the Jewish people that you're going to come back to the land of Israel, and that you know, if Haman knows everything that it says that he knows in the Medrash, and by the way, um, the Medrash has a, has the letters that was written to all the people that they were supposed to open on the thirteenth of Adar to kill the Jews. Those were long letters with historical facts about the Jewish people, or I mean, he twisted the facts, but he used it perfectly in a way to bring out the worst of the Jewish people, or at least to make the Jewish people sound so bad. So he knew he knew his stuff. So what was he really trying to do? So I'm going to try to explain this based on what I've read in, in preparing for this class, but there's so much more to it. So just bear with me for a minute. Haman realized that in logic, he can't win. In the in the in the revealed uh, the re revealed elements of godliness that are in this world, uh, Haman cannot win. Why? Because godliness in this world needs a, needs a conduit. It needs to have uh, it needs to have a, a, a place where it could it could rest, a, a place where it could reveal itself, and a place for it to uh, c connect to the rest of the world, to be a light to the rest of the world. And that is the Beis Hamikdash, and the the Jewish people are the ambassadors to do that. So the revealed level, the revealed elements of godliness, or at least the the elements of godliness that want to be revealed, need the Jewish people. God's infinite is, and, and God's essence, what's called Atmos Aaron Seif, you know, the essence of godliness is above it all. Now, the mistake Haman made was by thinking that in God's essence, it does like the world is, is it doesn't matter. Like in other words, in, where God is for himself, which is beyond our, be way beyond our comprehension, but the world, you can't say the world plays a role in God's essence because that means that if something happens bad to the world, then something's missing in God and that's not possible. So the point is, if Haman really figured if he could trend, if he could somehow uh, tap into that level of godliness, then you don't need the Jewish people anymore. It's all it's all the same. It's all what it says. The whole world is like nothing. So if I, if he can tap into that essence of godliness, he can maybe maybe overcome this need for having the Jewish people in the world. What was the victory? In other words, what Haman's mistake was is that the desire of God to, to have the Jewish people in the world was only in the level of godliness that associates with the world. The level of godliness that associates with the world needs the Jewish people because they need, it needs ambassadors. It needs people to do the mitzvahs. That's part of the plan. It's part of the, the, divine plan, the divine will, divine plan. But God for himself, God's essence is above it. So Haman is trying to tap into that level of godliness 
to override the revealed level of godliness to where the Jewish people are not necessary. You don't need people. You don't need anyone. You're above it. But his mistake was, is that the desire for there to be a world and the desire for the Jewish people to exist and the desire and the, and the commitment to the Jewish people and the, the desire for the Jewish people to fulfill the mitzvot don't just come from the real level of godliness. It actually comes from God's essence. So Haman was actually hurting himself instead of helping himself because all he was doing was tapping in. And I don't want to use words to God to, to misrepresent God because that's that's very dangerous and scary. But the idea here is, is that is that he's by tapping into the essence of Hashem, what he what he was doing is is revealing the connection and the and the ultimate sorry, the ultimate connection, the ultimate desire of God's essence and its connection to the Jewish people. And by doing that, the Jewish and, and as long as the Jewish people were, were able to, you know, have that self-sacrifice, which was also tapping into God's essence. So it was able to reveal that connection in a way stronger than was ever before. And by doing that, Haman basically was doomed. Because now what he did was, is he revealed that the, that the, that the, the existence of the Jewish people is not just a detail, but it's actually coming from the essence of God. And that is why the Purim holiday is never going to be um, uh, annul uh, annulled. And the and the Megillus Esther, the book of Esther, will never will never disappear even when Mashiach comes. Because this incident, this story brought out the essence of Hashem, the, 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 the infinite level of Hashem that can never ever be changed. It can never be nullified. It can never, and that's what we're hoping is going to be revealed when Mashiach finally comes. So this just will play right into it. So now, having said that, we still have our questions that we have to answer. We have the dates that are so that are so flexible. We have the, uh, we have the Megillah, um, which which the sages weren't sure should be included, um, and the name, which is a Persian name, which is also uh, which is also confusing. Now we also have the three the the breakdown of the three um, of the three types of places that read the Megillah. You have the cities that are walled cities since the days of Joshua. I'm sorry. You have the regular cities that did not look like that. I don't think. But you had cities that were not walled, and then you had the villagers, which which were, were the farmers and basically people that lived out in the wilderness that would mostly take care of the produce. And they all had different laws. They would all cel basically celebrate Purim on different dates. What what's the idea here? Why that? Do, why does the why is the Torah being so? Why are the sages in the Torah being so flexible instead of making it all be on one day or at least on two days? Why is there like different rules for different cities? Like that, that, that's so confusing. So here's this is actually from the encyclopedia. It's not this is not a Torah source, but this just gives us an insight into how the relationship between the cities and the and the farms and the villages would would, would work together. Cities were far from self sufficient, however, all and all dependent on close relationships with rural communities in their in their hinterlands. Uh, Renaissance Florence established such greatness in part because of the auspicious relations it maintained with the sheer copper croppers in the Tuscan countryside which provided the urban elite with the secure food supply, as well as with grain, oil, and wine, uh, which the Florentine elite in turn sold and traded throughout Europe. So basically, you, the cities, the people that lived in the cities needed to have, and it's not that dissimilar than today, to today, to be honest, but the people in the cities needed to have the, the farmers and they needed to have the, the, crop, the crop growers in order to um, create the produce that they wanted. But it wasn't just produce. Anything else that, they, that was being made uh, they needed to have the people beyond the walls of their cities uh, to create in order to or to produce in order to um, in order to build up their economy. So they all relied on each other. So now back to the Megillah reading. Let's explain why the Megillah reading is different for these three. Because there's a spiritual idea of these three cities. The walled city means that you're in a spiritual Mecca. You're in a place where there's plenty of spirituality. You have tons of kosher food. You have tons of, of Torah scholars. You have plenty of Torah classes. You have uh, you have an, you have friends. You have a community. You have an environment that is constantly holding you accountable and elevating you. You know to be more Jewish and to be more connected and to be more spiritual and to grow. That's what's being being in a walled city is. Uh, let's not call it a ghetto because it's really not. It's it's basically a, a, a you built those walls. You wanna protect yourself from outside influences and you want to decide the influence that you're going to have and therefore you choose you know you choose your neighbors you choose your 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 synagogue you choose you choose everything based on what, the way you want to grow so 
So you're basically safe. Physically and, and, and on, a, on a reality side, it was the same way. The people living in the walled, walled cities were considered to be safer. I'm sure real estate was much more expensive in a walled city because you had the protection of the city guards and the walls. What does the unwalled city mean? It means that you you don't have protection. In other words, you don't have the 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 spiritual protection. However, so you're basically involved in worldly matters. You're involved in materialism. You're involved in, in the reality of the world. But you're still living in a city, which means you're still maintaining your connection to Hashem. You're still trying to be part of a community and so on. Then comes the villages. The villages are basically people spiritually that are are that are almost disconnected from the the community from the from the influences from the positivity from the spiritual elements uh they also have to fend for themselves people that live in the villages physically uh, probably even today um have to have their own way of defending themselves because if you don't live in a city you don't have an established uh security uh, uh system or you don't have an established um uh, infrastructure so you kind of have to build it all yourself. So you're basically completely self-sufficient. Spiritually as well, a villager is completely self-sufficient. So now, what is the Mishnah telling us by, by differentiating the days of when you read the Megillah? What the, what the sages want us to know is that the Purim accomplishment, the idea of, the, of tapping into the infinite level of godliness, and the idea of revealing the infinite of godliness, which is what Haman tried to do with the lottery, but with what we were able to accomplish through the self-sacrifice and the commitment that we had to God, even in the most darkest times, is that by revealing that level of godliness, the purpose of that is to transcend the situation that we're in, and bring it down into whatever reality we may, we may find ourselves. So for the people in the walled cities who have all the spirituality that they want and need, and they're shielded from all negative influences, you'll have your perm later. You wait. You wait your turn. Okay? You'll have your perm on the 15th day of Adar. You're not allowed to read the Megillah before then. Because you guys, you're... you're this is what you do every day. So what? So you're going to do your your perm on the fifteenth day. You're living in an unwalled city, right? So you still have a community, which is basically pretty much every, like almost everyone, to an extent, like or in the sorry, the vast majority. So you're dealing with the reality of the world, yet you're still you know connected to your community. You're connected to 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 Jewish culture and Jewish ideology and Jewish learning and spirituality, but you're still battling between the two worlds. So Purim is that boost of energy on a regular work day, on a regular mundane day, to turn it into the holy day and happiest happiest day, still by being involved in the world, but at the same time, infusing it with the, with the infinite level of godliness, which is the joy that, by the way, this is why it says that you have to be so joyous that you don't know the difference between Haman and Mordechai. It's not... Just randomly, the, the Gemara doesn't say that randomly trying to tell us to get drunk. The Gemara is trying to tell us that we have to dive into the divine, sorry, into the infinite level of godliness where there is no difference between the two. Be where, where, where good and evil, where the sources of good and evil are all together because there's no differences. It's all God. It's all essence. That's the level we have to reach while we're living in the unwalled city. While we're living in the reality of the world, we have to unite the two. That is the general message of Purim. But the Mishnah has one more message. And what's the what's the most powerful point that the Mishnah tells us? That the villagers could read the Megillah as early as the 11th of Adar. Villagers come first. Why do villagers come first? Because they're the ones who are taking God to and revealing godliness in the most far-flung places you could imagine. They're the ones that, in spite of living in the most rural community, in the rural areas, despite living being lonely and, and without, without kosher food and without the education that they want for the children and without all the resources that they want, they're the ones who are actually bringing out the infinite level of godliness. They're living the miracle of Purim greater than anybody else. And that's why they get to read the Megillah from the 11th day. So we are going to distinguish between the cities because they're each accomplishing the mission of Purim on a greater level. The walled cities are the bare minimum. The unwalled cities are, are the regular. 
Now, in other words, you're combining both. You're combining the worldly matters with spiritual matters, and therefore Purim gives you the infusion. But the villagers are the ones who are the epitome of what Purim is all about. Taking the divine, taking the essence of Hashem, and bringing it to wherever you are, regardless of your situation, regardless of the challenges that you face. And that's why it could be on a market day. Because for a villager, a market day is a holy day. For a villager, going to the market is not a mundane act. For a villager, being involved in business, being involved in growing crops while saying to Hillim and while thinking Torah and while doing and while while doing things, even though they're living within the world within the most worldly matters, that is the ultimate accomplishment that Purim is trying to bring out. And therefore, they are considered, as you see, the the loyal soldiers of Hashem's army, and they're the ones who get to read the Megillah as er, uh, as early as possible. The Rebbe brings it out. In, in, in clearer words, people who live in walled cities can devote themselves completely to God because they're protected. Their spiritual uh, disposition is like an enclosed fortress that shields them from the unsavory influences of temptation. The spiritual task of people in outlying cities, like regular cities, to be surrounded by worldly temptation and nevertheless use these worldly resources for holy purposes. Thus, they create a city, a home for God. They don't need to plow, plant, and wait until the crops grow. They just take their pre-prepared, ready-made resources and turn them into a home, a city for Hashem. So that's the majority. However, the villagers, they must plow and soften the hardened soil. In other words, from a spiritual level, they have to work on themselves. They have to actually create that environment. They don't have a, a community that's already making it for them. They don't have the, 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 the atmosphere that you feel on a Jewish holiday. They have to create it. They are it. The villagers must plow and soften the hardened soil. Uh, the cor the corporal world where Hashem is not visible, and they from that from their efforts that's where they make it grow. The famous story of of Rableib Saris when he arrived at a city because he was trying to travel to 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 spend Yom Kippur with with, with his Rebbe. So he comes to a small town where there were only nine Jews, and they take him to this little tiny room, and he says, "Where's the synagogue?" And they say, "This is it. You're in it." In other words, they made the synagogue. This is this is what they built. In other words, we are it. You go to a far-flung city that the Chabad house is in the is in the rabbi's house, in the living room or in the rabbi's garage. That's the idea of a villager. Is that it's that this is it. This is this is the Judaism. This is where this is the spirituality we have in this city. That's a villager. A villager is where wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, and you don't have the established um, um, Jewish structure that you believe you need, and yet you're still able to create it. That's what Purim is all about. And that's why villagers read the Megillah on the 11th day of, of Adar, as early as they want to. So the unique dates of Purim were established specifically for the villagers, highlighting the message of Purim. These, there is hidden depth and holiness in the most ordinary places, such as a villager or a farmer. And that's why um, I, I was actually very proud of the subject email subject line, be a villager, is that even though we live in cities and even though we have, you know, Thank God. Some I guess some people will say that you know there's much better cities to live in, in terms of Jewish environment. I'm sure there are, but even though we do live in, in a place where thank God we have kosher food, we have we have us we have a shul, uh, we have some we have education to some extent. We have we have a, we have a plenty of resources here. Yet we could still have be a villager at heart in a sense that we don't allow the fact that when we're in at work or when we're in places that we that that we may not feel as comfortable to wear our yarmulke or places that we're not as comfortable to express our Judaism and we still do and we still bring godliness to the most far flung places that's being a villager so the Rebbe continues villagers they may not have this keen perception of Hashem but they don't but they don't relate to Hashem necessarily intellectually or emotionally but their relationship is marked primarily by obedience, which is which is the idea, which is a deeper connection. Nevertheless, their self-abnegation is complete. Their, their commitment to Hashem is, is pure. In fact, they surrender to Hashem, uh, is, the surrender to Hashem is driven by simple loyalty, is greater and deeper in some ways than the surrender of those who enjoy the rich intellectual relationship with Hashem. So the bottom line is, is that Purim is about the villagers. Purim should always be in the village. We should always call it Purim in the village. Um, the Rebbe once told this, told the, sorry, the Tzemach Tzedek once um, told a chassid, Rabbi Elia Abel, Abeler, um, and it, it, apparently he was a simple man. 
And they told him, I envy you. Why? Because you get to go to the marketplace, you go to the fairs, you meet so many people. And I'm sure that during your business transactions, you could get into a warm discussion about Judaism, a Talmudic mural, uh, moral, um, or you could just, or bringing spirituality in places that it's not necessarily revealed. You arouse the person's interest in studying the uh, esoteric dimensions of Torah. This causes a joy on high, and Hashem pays you a commission with the blessing of children, health, and sustenance. The larger fear, the more work there is. In other words, the bigger, more materialism, the more, um, the more physicality in the situation that you're in, the more opportunity there is to elevate and to reveal godliness. Uh, and therefore, there's also more reward. So ultimately, the message to us is that part, that you know most holidays, it's about putting aside the physical world and elevating ourselves to a spiritual reality. You know, most holidays of the Pesach is what we're going to do, right? We don't eat chametz. We separate ourselves from the ego of chametz, and we and we elevate ourselves to a spiritual idea of freedom, spiritual freedom with the matzah and the wine and the seder. Uh, and it's a very unique holiday. The same goes for Shuas. Uh, the same goes for every almost every other holiday. Purim is just the opposite. Purim, we're bringing it down. Purim, we are taking the infinite level of Hashem, the, this this revelation that's still going to take place when Mashiach comes, which is why Purim will, will stand forever, and we take that to the streets. We take it outside. We take it to the villages, because that is where it's most appreciated. That is where the purpose of Purim is most is most brought out. So let us, add, let, let us you know, recap the answers. So, how can we transform um, the, the boring daily grind um, of ordinary moments with profound meaning? The trick is to pause for a moment before beginning our activity to consider how to infuse what we're about to do with holiness. Everything we can do could be laced with holiness if we give it a chance. And why did the sages, in an exception to the Jewish practice, choose to establish multiple original dates for the festival instead of simply adding a makeup date? Is because Purim transforms multiple ordinary days into festival days because it's a holiday that reveals the secret of the divine in all things. And the holy energies are found in the most ordinary things, which means that every city has its own level of revelation and every city has its own opportunities. Every town, every village has its own opportunities and the sages wanted them to appreciate that, which is why Purim was established on multiple dates. Um, okay, let's now recap into the key points. So there are multiple dates and elements of Purim holiday. Villagers who cannot read the Megillah on the 14th of Adar committed earlier, a walled city celebrated on the 15th. Purim contains multiple ele elements that convey the same theme, turning the ordinary into something extraordinary, bringing godliness into, into the reality of the world. The material differences between the walled cities and unwalled cities and villages represent spiritual differences in level of godly awareness and connection, which also means there's more opportunity. Despite a village's distance from the city, uh, both ge geographically and spiritually, it is a village it is the villagers that are most dependable and capable of finding holiness in ordinary places, and that's why Purim brings out the beauty and the greatness of the villagers. And Purim teaches us to find the extraordinary, extra, extraordinary holiness in ordinary mundane things, places, and events. So, number one, let us have an easy fast tomorrow. It's a fast that, that commemorates Esther's three-day fast before she went to Achashverosh. And let us have a happy Purim where we could bring Purim, bring godliness to the streets. Where we That's what, one of the reasons why we have to go give out Shalach Manas is because it's not enough to celebrate on our own with our own meal, but we have to go out and find people, find friends who we can share the joy of Purim with. It's also why there's a special mitzvah of giving Matanas Le'avionim, giving gifts to the poor, even though it's a mitzvah every day. Tzedakah is a mitzvah it's supposed to do every day. So what's special about Purim? It's because Purim especially is about bringing holiness into everything. And the way we do that is by going out of ourselves, out of our comfort zone, and finding those who could use or could benefit from, from something that we have and be able to have spread the joy of Purim to them as well. Uh, and let us hope that the joy of Purim will finally reveal what Purim is really all about, which is the essence of Hashem through the coming of Mashiach. Let's hope it happens speedily. Let's hope we could win this victory over Amalek, over Amalek which our own, we have our own Amalek in our times. So let's hope we could have a complete victory uh, and safety for the Jewish people and for the people of Israel and, of course, for the hostages. Chavis, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Amen. Happy Purim.